so bowing yeah bowing is is uh, an interesting thing and uh it's uh quite a um it's quite interesting from a a, 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 a a cultural perspective of course because in in um certainly in asian cultures and bowing is what you do normally in buddhist cultures and you know other you know hindu and so on and then you you just you know just you bow all the time and uh in the west we have a bit of a a, a, a problem with it sometimes and uh you know it's it's sort of in if you read the old testament it's constantly saying you know bowing to graven idols is what it talks about that's that's like one of the major themes of the old testament is don't bow to graven idols yeah then all kinds of terrible things are going to happen to you so that i don't think we can have uh so many hundreds of thousands of years of um cultural uh history and then just kind of overcome it whereas in in eastern cultures it's much more bowing is much more normal thing and part part of everyday life and uh often the 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 children will bow to the parents and the and the the uh you know or people will bow to say a school teacher or something like that you know it's not considered to be such a a huge deal uh but like a gesture of of both uh humility and uh respect so you know you, if you want you could probably trace it back to you know some very basic biological mechanisms you know maybe like they're kind of the the two animals and you know, two dogs if they're fighting and then one of them kind of shows submission to the other dog yeah and so something like that so this is this kind of way of physically uh expressing a relationship like that but one of the things with uh <coughs> bowing in uh buddhism is that it's it's uh always regarded as a conventional reality rather than rather than uh something which is um uh necessarily relates to sort of a person's you know intrinsic degree of purity or something like that this is quite actually quite an important point um it's something which expresses a social relationship yeah rather than uh rather than and 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 I think sometimes we 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 tend to want to load too much onto it but it expresses a social relationship this actually was was the basis of a a, a conflict in Thailand um uh, maybe uh, I can't remember the details of it maybe 150 years ago now I'm just trying to think of the details of this but there was a uh conflict Look, I can't remember the details of the personalities who were involved, but there was one person who was a very senior person in Thai society, maybe a member of the royal family or something, uh and who so the story I've been told, who believed that they were a stream enterer. Okay? So they believed that they'd entered the first stage of enlightenment. And uh <coughs> they tried to make an argument that with one of the senior monks who they were friends with that that uh that that the 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 sangha or the ordained people should bow to a an enlightened lay person yeah so there was this dispute you know you can acknowledge well in terms of spiritual development you can have a lay person who's very enlightened and very awakened and maybe have a monk who's not at all yeah full of defilements yeah and uh, so who should bow to who right and of course the problem is that once you start getting into that then <laughs> you know you, where are you going to, how do you judge those things you know who is there to to judge it and and it sort of gets bound up with personal conceit and all of these kinds of things so the important point in buddhism is that it's not about you know a personal level of spiritual attainment or something about that it's about respecting social relationships yeah and uh so uh in traditionally in in the asian cultures and in the indian culture that that one would bow to one's teacher and so that one of the things that that does is to, that sets up a uh relationship of respect and of humility so you're ready to listen to what they say yeah and and of course that may change yeah in one situation somebody may be a teacher and the other one the student and then the next time they may swap yeah so you know it doesn't it's not necessarily a fixed relationship but it's a conventional relationship which has a certain role within a certain context so that's really the um the main purpose of bowing and you know i find that that uh, for myself it's something which uh 
in a way is um, a kind of physical a way of physically trying to present or embody the, a sense of grace and a sense of humility uh, towards that which we revere and that which we place uh, as the highest value in our life. And it's interesting that after the Buddha uh, became uh, enlightened, uh, he said, who should I bow to? Who should I what? Who should I worship? Because you can't be happy unless you're bowing to something, you know, or worshiping something. And uh, so he said, "Well, I should I should worship the Dhamma, yeah. So this is the, this is the highest thing, yeah. And uh, so when we take that attitude of bowing, it it helps us to let go of a lot of the hardness of our heart." Traditionally, in, in the monastic communities, they do a lot of bowing, and uh, it depends. The actual conventions depend on uh, the time and place. But in in the Ajahn Chah tradition, where I was ordained, you, you usually, usually, generally speaking, in the Buddhist traditions, you'd bow whenever you come into a monastery. So if you arrive at a monastery, you'll come or, or a center or whatever, you'll go to find the main shrine and bow to the main shrine. Uh, and generally speaking, also you'd bow to the senior monk or nun uh, at a convenient occasion. Yeah, so you shouldn't sort of hunt people down when they're, you know, <laughs> in the toilet or something like that. But uh, at a proper occasion, when they're seated and you know, ready, then you should take the take the opportunity to bow and pay respects to the, the senior monks or nuns. Um, uh, and uh, usually, if so, say these these last few days we've had a visiting senior uh, nun, Bikuni uh, Chiguang Sunim, who's uh, um, come and spent a few days with us and helping to prepare for the uh, seminary ordination on Sunday, and she'll be the the preceptor on that, the Bikuni preceptor, and. Uh, so when she came as a senior nun, then we all took the opportunity to bow to her. Uh, at, and as in the kind of the monastic community, we'll wait till everybody has their robes on and can bow properly. Uh, so yeah, you shouldn't bow if it's like a, a too formal or uh, sorry, an informal or kind of rushed situation or something like that. So. Um, And and of course you can can also choose take up bowing as a um, more of a, uh, a an intensive practice, and that's most identified with the, in the Tibetan tradition where they will just just constantly bow, doing hundreds of thousands of prostrations, and they do like the full length one from standing to lying down prostration. And if you go to places like Bodh Gaya and so on, you'll see people doing that very energetically, working up a good sweat. And uh, that actually gives you a good idea of why they would do it. Because in, in ancient India and in, in uh, places like Thailand and so on, um, you typically would do quite a lot of walking meditation or wandering around the place and so on. And so you, you, that's how you get your exercise. Yeah? If you're staying in Tibet or somewhere, there's nowhere to walk. Right? You can't do walking meditation. And uh, you can't just sit still all day and do your chanting and your sitting meditation. So they need to move their body and so this is one way that's that's just uh, evolved within that context so you can do that practice as a devotional practice develop your energy develop your faith develop your mindfulness and uh, uh, sort of by doing the kind of endless rounds of prostrations and it's interesting when you see people doing that you know so it, it, it always strikes me as being a bit kind of spiritual materialistic you're given these kind of number you have to do a hundred thousand prostrations or something like that you know and uh, but the quality seems to vary quite a bit, and uh, <laughs> I noticed that uh, at Bodh Guy you see some people just up down, up down, up down, and they're building up a big sweat and so on. And then yeah, I noticed especially the uh, the Taiwanese nuns who were doing it were very kind of very collected and very kind of graceful and very careful each bow, sort of you know really putting a lot into each one. So I, I kind of think that it's more to do with the the uh, quality rather than just racking up the numbers. <laughs> so uh, there's a kind of there's that bowing practice. 
So I guess when we bring Buddhism into a country like Australia, then that's something which um, uh, you know get, gets negotiated along the way. And uh, I think most people kind of pick it up after a while. Some people have a problem with it. Um, others, I think most people have not too much of a problem, too much of an issue. Uh, so the other thing that uh, you asked me to talk about today is about mainly about metta and uh, continuation from the metta retreat, how to develop metta. Gosh, um, I don't know, I've only been <laughs> doing it for the last 15 years. I'll, I'll let you know when I've worked it out. But uh, it's not an easy matter. And it's something which always seems to slip from your grasp. You know, our mind is so changeable and so variable. And sometimes we can think that we've been developing so well and everything's going so good and then poof, it just all goes out the window. So when it comes to developing metta, like developing anything in the Dhamma, then we need to approach it carefully and respectfully and with a lot of humility. The further we go into it, the more uh, we realize how deep it goes. You know, maybe we initially we start the, the, the practice with a fairly... <coughs> You know, a fairly limited or fairly simple idea. We think, okay, we want to get it, you know, be a bit more happy, or we want to get a bit more peace, or something like that. The further we go into it, we begin to realize that the practice just goes so deep. And uh, I remember reading uh, a, a book by a fellow called Daryl Reaney. He's an Australian scientist now deceased, and uh, his book, I think, was called the music of the mind or something like that and he was talking about uh, cosmology and the way that uh, um, the universe is built up out of the big bang and the way that atoms form and things like that and one of the things he talked about <coughs> which I found very powerful was how in those moments you know you've got this kind of moment of, of near chaos and and then things start to form and order starts to form atoms start to coalesce and things start to to gather together in patterns electrons and protons begin to form pairs you know it's just a hydrogen atom it's just one electron and one proton and if you follow through step by step then that is love and that is like the highest kind of spiritual love which you can have and there's no there's no dividing line that can separate the attraction of an electron and a proton yeah, from the, 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 the unconditional love that one can develop through matter. Yeah. It goes little bit by little bit by little bit. Matter organizes itself in ever more complex ways, forming planets and so on, and then the, uh, the uh, living things start to arise, more and more complexity, and there's always that kind of binding force, that attractive force that, that holds things together and holds patterns together. And then that's also the thing which binds our heart together. And that's not just a, um, not just a metaphor, but also is a reality that, that in, in our bodies you can measure. The chemicals get broken up and scattered when you have a lot of anger. You, know, you have different kinds of chemicals get produced, the order inside the brain gets fractured and it's actually like a measurable kind of physical uh, sense of, of uh, disorder and decay that happens through through the emotion of anger and, and the opposite when, when, when the love is in the body and in the mind then it builds itself up and more in harmony and so that 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 attitude of metta goes all the way down yeah, it goes all the way down. Wherever you look for it in creation, you will always find it. Yeah, so it is the binding force that holds the universe together. So when we practice loving kindness, we're not just doing something which is um, uh, a, 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 uh, a, a device 
to help us to feel good for a period of time. We're doing something which on a very profound level allows us to uh, become more in tune with how the universe actually is. so that our own mind and body is working with nature, working with the universe, working in harmony. So this idea of being in harmony and resonating is something which uh, for me is very vivid from my time as a musician. And again, that's something that you can literally see. Uh, if, you, if you see a, a guitar string, then you can see when two strings are in harmony that they actually will resonate together. Yeah? And you can, you, can, you can literally see that. You can actually watch <coughs> the harmonics. You can watch them and you can watch them when they are not in harmony and the, the, the string is, is fractured. The, vibra the patterns of vibration are fractured. And that's exactly what's happening in your mind when you're doing metta meditation. You're learning to make the different aspects of the mind vibrate together in harmony. Yeah? And just like a, a guitar or an instrument which is in tune will sound beautiful, and one which is not in tune will sound appalling, will sound revolting. Yeah? It's quite extraordinary that the difference between something sounding really beautiful and sounding really awful is just tiny, it's just this tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of difference. And so, just, and so when, when you're playing music, there's some way in which that is actually responding to a, uh, a, a specific a reality, a physical reality. It's not just a convention, but there's actually a reality to it. I don't know if anybody saw, uh, there was an article that came out about two, a couple of weeks ago, somebody sent it through to me on an email of, of uh, an experiment that was done in Washi Washington by the Washington Post. They, got, they, got, they had a world-class violinist. I can't remember his name. Can you remember his name? I can't remember his name. But he's one of the top uh, concert violinists in the world. And uh, he uh, was playing... He, had, he has his like, $3 million Stradivarius violin and they got him busking in Washington, D.C., in, in, uh, in the subway. And so they did it as an experiment. And so they got him down there. There he was. And uh, they videotaped the whole thing. And so there he is playing this incredible you know, music. It's the most amazing violin pieces that's ever been composed on the, you know, the, the, the best violinist in the world on the most amazing v instrument, playing the greatest music that's ever been written, and everyone just walks past and ignores him. <laughs> just walk past. More than a thousand people walked past and ignored him, and a few people just glanced and then just walked on. A few people threw a quarter in his in his violin case, and uh, and like you know, one or two people stood and listened for for five minutes or ten minutes, and then sort of put some money in and then left. One one lady recognised him and was completely blown out by it. And they, they kind of did these interviews with all these people afterwards. And it was very interesting looking at the interviews, you know, because what are they they're doing in their life? They're, they're just not there, you know. They're always they're somewhere else. They've got to be somewhere. And they just weren't able to be there and be in the present moment, yeah? And we weren't able to recognize what's happening. But the most interesting thing about the whole event was that every time when a child walked past with its parents, the child would always want to stop every time. And the parents, every time, pulled them on and wouldn't let them stop and wait. <laughs> yeah? Every time. Yeah? That's, that's it. That's, that's why we live in a sick world right there. Yeah? The child knows, yeah? and uh, it's the parents were too busy to let them. Yeah? And... Um, so it was interesting, I mentioned this to our, uh, our friendly builder at, at Santi Monastery. His wife is a, teaches music to children. And he was really interested because he said that that was her, one of her big 
things that she kept on trying to persuade the parents is that children are naturally musical and you just have to sort of allow them to be musical and then they'll be able to, 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 to play things rather than having to sort of force them into boxes. And so she was very interested in that. So that, you know, to me that's, that's, um, that's an example of that, 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 that quality, that kind of natural quality of things. Yeah? So that quality of love and kindness, again, it's something which is a natural quality. You don't have to be taught to recognize it. Yeah? Children will recognize it. It's their nature to recognize it. It's not something which is a, sort of a, a, a social convention. Our brains and our minds are formed in response to love and kindness. And this is one of the, you know, the most important findings in, in modern developmental psychology is that it's the, the love, especially the loving gaze of the mother with the child, which forms the child's brain and the child's consciousness in those very early um, weeks and, and months of its life. So this is that force, that very real force, which is helping to form our minds. So this is one of the reasons why in, in teaching metta, uh, I, I, again and again I try to emphasize the, the playfulness of it, yeah? the, the silliness of it, the childlikeness of it. Yeah? It some, should be something that comes naturally. Yeah, it should be something which just arises. That's why I always take a teddy bear along to my meta retreats. Yeah, so I think this is one of the the innovations that I'm proudest of in as a Buddhist monk. Is I, I, as far as I'm aware, the first monk who's ever taken a teddy bear along to a retreat. And who, who, this is why is it's the playfulness of love and kindness, the spontaneity of it, and the hard part is to turn that is to really use that spontaneity, yeah? So to develop it. That's, this is the hard part, always in life, yeah? You can have that spontaneous creative urge. How do, you, how do you actually then live that and do that every day, yeah? Without losing the edge, without you losing the spontaneity and so on. And that's the really hard part, and that's what makes the difference between somebody who's <coughs> just in a good mood and who happens to f be feeling happy because everyone feels happy for now and then, everyone feels loved now and then, yeah? and then somebody who really develops it. Yeah? So the first step to that is the ability to consciously reflect on it. Yeah? And that's, that's the absolute key to, to everything, every kind of development, the ability to say, okay, what's going on? To look in, to say, this is what love is, this is what anger is, this is what's good, this is what's bad, this is what's skillful, this is what's unskillful, to be able to understand what's going on in your own mind, to discern, okay, and to have that interest in it. If you can do that, then everything else is basically just, just kind of management, okay? Everything else is, is, uh, is just the kind of making it work, but that's the essential thing, the ability to reflect and to move the mind in that way. So we want to, if you think, think of these, these qualities that we want in, in developing love and kindness, we want to have, in a sense, a, um, we want it to be uh, repeatable, okay? So you're gonna do meditation, you wanna be able to sit and meditate and do it. It's not, just so, it's not just something which happens spontaneously in that circumstance. You want to be able to sit down and say, now I'll do this. So there has to be there's a certain deliberateness to it, yeah? a certain repeatability. But at the same time, there's also a spontaneity, the spontaneity of the emotional response, okay, which is arising there. Yeah? There's also the basic quality of happiness. Okay? Now metta, loving kindness, always should go along with happiness. The two always go together. And the other thing which also goes goes there and is, is part of that thing that we want to develop is the the thing of um, peacefulness or steadiness or unity. Okay? So we want a certain we want the mind to be together, we want the mind to be integrated to to work as a whole. Okay? So these are some of the different mental qualities that we're looking to develop through this metta meditation. And if you've, uh, in, if you c come back and look at those qualities I've just described, those, those qualities are actually the five jhana factors, okay? 
the five jhana factors, Vitaka, Vichara, Piti, Sukha, Ekagata in Pali. Vitaka is the initial application, Vichara is sustained application, Piti is rapture, Sukha is happiness, Ekagata is one pointedness. So each one of these has its role to play in meditation. And it's and and these this teaching of these five factors, five mental factors, as being the key to meditation is one of the most important contributions that the Buddha made to meditative culture and, and spiritual development. This is this is something which is taught hundreds and hundreds of times throughout the Buddha's discourses and is found every school has it and it's found with almost um, uh, absolute consistency and rigor throughout every strata and, and strand of Buddhist teaching. It's absolutely fundamental to the Buddhist teaching and understanding of meditation. So the Vitaka is, the in, is what they call the initial application, moving the mind, applying the mind to the object. So this is what you do when you, you sit down to meditate, may I be happy. You bring that thought up into your mind. Yeah. Now that's something that you do Right? It's a deliberate act. Right? As such, it's not uh, spontaneous. Right? And it can, by itself, it can be quite artificial. Right? It's just having that thought. It's only a thought. It's limited by all the limitations that thought has. Okay? But it helps to d direct the mind, it helps to uh, establish your mind, and it helps to, at the very least, free your mind from bad thoughts. So at least you can have a good thought. Yeah, that's all right. You're not going to hurt anybody. May you be happy. It's all right. No one, no one ever did any harm by doing that. And you can do some good. Yeah, and so sometimes just those things is just enough to bring, bring some happiness and joy into people's lives. I remember when one time when I was catching a bus from from uh, Central in in Sydney, I caught a bus out to Newtown or something, and it was Glebe. And uh, this fellow on the bus, he was just so overjoyed; he just couldn't contain his happiness. He just stand up in the middle of the bus and say, "All the men are handsome and the women are beautiful." <laughs> <laughs> Is he? he, is he? I, I, look, I imagine that he must be a kind of a local character. Yeah, I only saw him that once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what his secret is, um, <laughs> what he's on, or something like that. And he, well, he, he, he just got up and he just said, said, everyone, I just want you to to know that the the driver of this bus is a, is a, a very dedicated professional, and he's a really excellent driver. <laughs> And you can be fully confident in his hands that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's terrific. So everyone had a really great trip, you know, that was, that was so easy. So you can do that, yeah? You can have that kind of positive thought and bring that, bring that into mind. So it's a vitaka. Vichara is keeping it going. Okay, so vichara is keeping it in mind. Vitaka is bringing it to mind. Vichara is keeping it in mind. Yeah, and so that's the steadiness in time with which with which we keep applying ourselves to the meditation. So not just scattered, not just a bit now and then falling away, but keeping it going, 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 keeping it going. Keeping it going. And again, this is something that we can do. We can't um, necessarily. Uh, just say, okay, we're just going to do it, you know, that's it. Uh, our mind will, will wander off and we'll have to be brought back and so on and so forth. But there is a degree to which we can say, okay, we can just keep on trying, keep on trying, keep on trying. And again, there's a deliberateness to that. There's, it can also, there can be a, almost a, it can be a bit boring, right? It can drag if you're just doing that. If you're just, just applying yourself to a meditation and just bashing away at it, then it's a drag. Yeah? And if that's all there is to meditation, then you're not going to do it for very long because you're just going to sit there and bash away at it for a while and then think, what's, what's the point of what am I doing? And then you're going to go and watch telly or something like that. So, but that's, it's still it's a part of it. Each one of these things is building up those little bits and pieces, little, little um, building blocks. 
And then the third one is the rapture of the piti. Now that rapture is an emotional response, and that's where the spontaneity of it comes in. Yeah, so that, that's the thing you can't control so much. Right? It just happens. The zing happens. The zest happens. Why is it there? Why is it not? Who knows? Things come together. Sometimes you're in a good mood, sometimes you're not. With practice, you can learn to bring it up more and more. Yeah? So you can actually learn to turn the mind to it and actually evoke it. Yeah? That's, a, that's a skill in meditation. It's not that difficult to do, actually. Yeah? It's actually one of the tricks in meditation that, that you can learn to sit down, apply your mind to the meditation, and then just go zoop and just bring the rapture up. Yeah? It's possible to do that. And the, 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 the trick to, to rapture is that it's, a, um, it's, like a, it's like a resonance or a frequency. So you have to kind of learn to tune into that. Yeah? It's a way of applying your mind in the right way. Now it's, very, as an, it's an emotional response. And as an emotional response, it's incredibly individual. Okay? It's difficult to give a formula for how to make that happen. It's difficult to standardize it. But it is something that, that should be looked for and should be um, recognized. Yeah? So this is the main thing that we can do you know, in terms of teaching meditation is just to say, you know, look for these things and recognize it when you, when you see it and learn to notice what are the signs of it, what are the characteristics of it, and how to, how to repeat it, how to keep going. But it's the piti, the rapture, which which rises like a wave inside your body, yeah, which makes the hair stand on end, which brings tears to the eyes, which which make you um, uh, feel feel light, feel like you're going to float off your seat. Uh, all of these kinds of sensations, which is giving a, which is almost giving a uh, um, a, a message, or telling you very clearly and very explicitly. This is working. Yeah? Something's happening. Right? And so it's when <coughs> this starts to happen, you begin to realize, oh, I'm not just bashing my head against a meditation object. Right? And I remember when I first started to have these kinds of experiences, I was quite shocked. I was quite stunned. I was like, oh, crikey, this, this, this doesn't happen to me. Right? This is the kind of thing that like, you know, really kind of good meditators and mystics and people with you know, advanced consciousness and things like that, these, these kinds of, that's not me. I can't have these kinds of feelings and stuff just from sitting here and meditating. But it's true. It did happen. And it happened to me and it can happen to you. It can happen to everyone. Because again, it's part of the human mind. Yeah? It's not part of, it doesn't belong to anyone. It's how the mind works. So that's that rapture, it gives an uplift to the mind. And then the sukha is what gives the peace and the, the bliss, the tranquility. And that's sort of the kind of pervasive and, and um, uh, rich and sweet sense of, of joy, a sort of contentedness. Yeah, it's more subtle. Yeah. And so that's the, the sukha is what is uh, sticky. Whereas the, the rapture is lifting up, it's bouncy, and the sukha is sticky. It, it um, binds together, holds things together. It's the happiness or the bliss. And then the last one is uh, the one-pointedness. Yeah? So, and that is the, that state of, of unity of the mind. So these are the, that's what we call the five jhana factors. And these are, are qualities of the mind qualities which are present in everybody's mind and qualities which are, sh are to be developed through meditation, through metta meditation and through any other kind of meditation that you do as well. Uh, but I'm talking about it now in the context of metta meditation. So you can see that when we develop metta, as, as I, we did in the guided meditation earlier, that each of these um, qualities comes into play. Yeah, the, the, the initial application of mind when we start saying, may I be happy to ourselves, the 
sustained application when we keep that going over a long period, the, the rapture is a, a <coughs> sense of uplift in the heart, you know, the bliss, a sense of contentedness, one pointedness, and things come together. So all of these things together is what makes uh, the metta meditation work. Now, one of the um, <coughs> one of the things that happen, or one of the issues that we all have to deal with, of course, is that uh, when we um, uh, come out of our meditation, we have to get back into the so-called real world, as some people would have it. And one of the interesting things is that it's sometimes very easy to develop loving kindness for people who are not there. <laughs> and much harder to develop it for actual human beings. <laughs> you know? So uh, one solution to that is, of course, the hermit solution is to say, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with human beings. Right? I'm going to go away into the mountains, sit in a cave and develop loving kindness for everybody who's not there because I couldn't stand it if they actually were there. Yeah? So that's my preferred solution. Okay, <laughs> And uh, then uh, if you do that for a while, it's very interesting because you go away and you develop love and kindness uh, for people for, you know, for, for a few weeks or whatever, and then you come back and you see everybody and you're filled with love and kindness for them for at least a, you know, a few hours and then before it kind of wears off. And... <laughs> then uh, back to back to the real world again and so in a, in a sense there's there's a there's a different uh, it's one of the things that I've learned um, over the years is that uh, there's a difference between um, states of mind that you can get in meditation and uh, like a development of a personality or development of character which is a different kind of thing and you know, even though we can laugh about it, but it actually is quite possible for people to develop uh, very advanced states of meditation uh, in in retreats or in in you know uh, sometimes just by accident, sometimes just one-off circumstances. People can drop into quite profound states of meditation, and yet they're they're personally you know maybe not very well developed in terms of their character. And I, I used to think this was. Ridiculous! I thought it was not possible. I thought, you know, they they must be just deluded or whatever. But uh, since then, uh, I've come to realize that it's not. It's, it, it actually is quite possible, and uh, in fact, not not at all uncommon. It is possible to have genuine, deep mystic states of concentration or whatever, but also to be quite undeveloped as a human being. Yeah? There are different aspects of the mind which need to be developed in different ways. Yeah. They can complement and support and inform each other, but they um, but they need not, okay, and they don't like these two aspects of development don't support each other to the extent that the person, the individual concerned, sees them as separate and and wants to divide them up into separate domains, yeah. So if you, when I, this is one thing I've learned to 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 notice as a spiritual teacher, is if you see uh, somebody who says, "Oh, I got such and such a state in meditation," or or something like that, that's one thing. If you see someone who um, uh, uh, maybe is very good to be with and is a very you know nice, helpful, friendly person or something like that, it's another thing, right? But one of the one of the actual things that to me becomes more and more important in terms of actually understanding where a person's spiritual development is, is the extent to which they see a conflict or not between those two areas. And whenever I see people who, who, who see a conflict between their inner personal spiritual development and the way they're relating in the world, then that's telling me that their mind is not integrated. Yeah? and that those two aspects of their being or their development are not really understood and really integrated very well. Yeah? So to me, that's, that's more of an interesting uh, measure of, of a person's uh, development than, than uh, more specific things in terms of their meditation. So... Uh, when we come to develop metta in terms of our um, 
uh, uh, sort of broader sort of basis of character development uh, than it has to do uh, with things like speech, yeah, uh, how we uh, behave, how, what, what we choose to do, how we do duties, how we do work. So it's interesting that when we, d we g did the Metta Sutta earlier, the first third of that Metta Sutta is actually talking about character development. It's not talking about meditation development. And that's quite two quite separate sections of, of the discourse. You know? okay, this, is what you sh this is what should be done. You should be uh, straightforward, you should be gentle in speech, you should be content, and all of these things. And this whole kind of list of good ethical and character qualities which need to be developed, that's one aspect of development. Okay, That's one thing. Another thing, then developing the meditation. They're two things. They don't conflict with each other and they don't they can't replace each other. Yeah, you can't do one at the expense of another. But they have to both be done and they have to both be seen. You have to always striving to be see these things as supporting and helping each other. The more you see these things as conflicting, then the more that's a sign of a lack of integration in your own mind. So that's probably all I've got time for this talk this evening. I didn't get around much to the five hindrances, so maybe that has to be another talk. Um, so I offer that for your reflection this evening, and like to uh, see if anyone has any comments or questions.